Well, hello everyone. I want to welcome uh, everyone tonight to the Fish webinar at Lawrence and Waypoint Management. Uh, just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover tonight. We're going to cover a better way to, of understanding how to operate a Lawrence unit and what you're seeing on the screen when you're out in the water. Uh, more about the waypoints and how to clean them up with some quick and easy steps uh, using your computer, and we'll get into more detail as we go through the presentation. Uh, how Insight Genesis provides you with options to download your maps for use for your Lorance uh, and other chart plotters. Uh, we did a seminar, question and answer seminar, uh, last December, and it was a huge success for Fishy. And we got lots of feedback, and with that feedback, the majority said they would like for us to do an electronic class, so that's why we're here tonight. Uh, just want to quickly, for those that came to attend tonight's webinar, uh, I'm recording it, and there will be instructions either on the blog for Fish Steve, or Jared will give instructions later on how we're going to uh, be able to access this webinar in the future. Uh, this request is on behalf of the people from Louisiana that emailed me and texted me throughout the present week saying they were evacuated from their homes. And on behalf of Fishy, our thoughts and prayers go out to those affected. And once their lives get back to normal, they too can view this presentation uh, we record tonight. So uh, also just stay tuned uh, the end, at the end of the presentation. I have some awesome down and side images that you don't want to miss. Uh, so everybody stay tuned. Uh, I still see that there's some joining, so this presentation is being recorded. And if you have any questions, you can be asked uh, per John's instructions. Uh, we also at Fishy, we, me and John would love to hear some feedback on uh, this webinar, uh, either on Fishy or by email. So feel, please feel free to, to email us and or post it on Fishy uh, if this uh, in any way affected the way you do fishing. Uh, also for this webinar, I have attached five spreadsheets, uh, and we'll go over those at the end of the presentation uh, that you can pull off tonight. And uh, so with that, let's uh, get the presentation started. So the agenda for tonight, uh, we're going to cover Insight, Insight Genesis, we're going to cover the system, uh, the setup of your, your, your ranch unit, the tools within that setup, importing and exporting data. There'll be several uh, pages on that. Uh, 2D sonar, structure scan and balance scan sonar, uh, waypoint management, uh, and then south, side and down scan views on the water. So that's our agenda for tonight. Uh, just quickly, uh, for you college, uh, kids out there, uh, there's opportunities. I know Jared was one of the winners of a new GM2 uh, through this program, but you can actually log sonars on the lake and uh, and win prizes. So uh, if you got any questions, like I said, there's a, one of the attachments at the end of the presentation will have uh, how to go about registering for this. Uh, also for high school students. Same thing, uh, they just have two different programs, one for the high school and one for the college. So, Insight Genesis, what is Insight Genesis? A lot of people that have or ranch units do not utilize this tool. And if you're not utilizing this, you're really missing the boat. Uh, this Insight Genesis, you, you can record your body of water. Uh, there's bodies of water that I have that's around here locally that are small individual lakes that are just a blue glob. If you look at your orange and it's just a blue glob, no contour lines, nothing. I've actually mapped those lakes and I have actual maps of those lakes that are one foot interval and everyone else is looking at a blue glob. I'm looking at an actual map of that lake. And it also gives you bottom hardness, vegetation layers, uh, you can do customized coloring. You can do waypoints within the, the Insight Genesis. It's really a, a neat tool. Uh, like I said, there's a there's an attachment on this presentation that tells you how to go about downloading it on your Orange unit, how to go in and, and, and start recording your logging your sonar. 
Uh, so that's that's within that attachment. This just a in, uh, quick inside Genesis uh, sonar, and then look advance, and then you log, log the sonar. And this is what the the settings that when you set in that, this is the settings that you want to uh, pick uh, on your unit. You want to go to sonar, hit advance, log sonar. I usually put the name of the lake and the date as my because I usually change the file name. Uh, each time, uh, you want to make sure your unit is set at 200 kilohertz and chirp, and then uh, ping it to the max, uh, so you can get the max uh, result on your inside Genesis map. So this is what the Go Free site looks like. Uh, it's a free uh, website, and this kind of walks you through. You go to Go Free, you click on Inside Genesis, you set yourself an account. And then once you set yourself an account, you log into it, and then it keeps records. You can see the lakes that record uh, what's on there. And then you can also go back and review those records, and it also records your sonar, too. So you can actually, while you're pre-fishing during the day, you can record your sonar and map the lake. And at the end of the day, you can actually go back and look at the lake and see the sonar that you recorded that day. So you may be you might have been fishing, not paying attention to your sonar, and miss the stump or a crucial piece of uh, debris or, or or structure down in the water. You may have missed because you wasn't focused on your unit, and this this here will allow you to pick that up again. And it's, it's like I said, it's a really neat tool, and you really have to get into it and play with it to fully understand it. So uh, this kind of shows you what I was talking about earlier. As you can see to the right is just a typical uh, Lorentz map and the one to the left is one that I recorded and it shows the contour, the contour lines, it shows the bottom hardness uh, with this view. John, is, is, there, is everything coming through okay? John? Yeah, you're looking good, Eddie. Good. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were good. All right. So this this right here is just a quick reference uh, of your button layout for an HDS unit. Uh, this is really more so for the Gen ones, but it's the same same principles for the Gen two and Gen three. Uh, just that you don't have the soft keys at the bottom in the Gen two and Gen threes. It's more touch screen. So, but this kind of gives you an overview. Uh, what uh, what each button and what it does. Okay, so system information for HDS. Uh, the the biggest issue that people have with their units is no one takes the time to update because Lorance and the guys with uh, Navionics are constantly updating uh, their electronics, and you if you're if the, most of the time, probably half the problems that people bring to me with their units, if they just updated them, it would fix most of the problems. So this kind of talks you, talks or shows you how to go into the system, how to look for about down at the bottom, software version, and then it tells you how to go into the Lorentz site and click on the support and click on the software updates, find your unit within those updates, and then once you find it, all you have to do is download that off the rent or rent site. It's all free. Download it onto an SD card, put it in your unit, let it do its process, and then once it's done, take the SD card back out of the unit, take that that file back off of that SD card, and your, your unit's ready to go. Once you restart the next time, it'll be ready to go. And this tells you, this tells you, walks you through each step, how to find your unit, at the top left, your right shows you the, how to download the software. You just click Save As on, and save it to an SD card. It's pretty simple. Same thing with Navionics. It, Navionics, each day, they, as you can see up here at the top, let me see if I can get my cursor here, the point, it's got daily updates on Navionics. I, I typically update my Updates on my Navionics, I typically do them once a week. 
or before a major tournament. So uh, if you have Navy Onyx cards, uh, you need to be updating them at least once a week because they're updating daily with new uh, contours, new uh, everything. So that's another thing. I, I've, I've seen uh, Navy Onyx cards that people brought to me and they've never been updated. And it takes a long time if you don't keep it, keep on top of it. It takes a long time for us to download the, all that information to, to keep it updated. Okay, so uh, this right here, just a quick overview of what we just talked about uh, as far as how to download the information. Uh, like I said, this this uh, presentation tonight will be available uh, afterwards for you to go back and review and where you can print off these sheets if you need to and go to your unit and uh, it's a lot simpler to have it in front of you with your unit. So all of this will be uh, part of the presentation that will be available after the night. All right, so screen size. People ask me, okay, so HDS7, is it any different than HDS9 other than the screen size? Yes, it is. Actually, uh, the, the smaller the screen, the less pixels uh, that there is. So the bigger the screen, the, the better the the picture quality is so uh, compact in the screen makes it hard to see the targets. Uh, usually, I, on my 12 or my 10, I normally don't go less than three screens. You can go four, but it's really hard to pick anything out. Uh, I highly suggest purchasing another unit and making it a dedicated so uh, so you can visually see uh, if you're on your down scan or your side imaging, you can you can scan it out to 60 and 80 feet and uh, really get a good quality picture. Uh, if you if you do the smaller screens, it really takes away from what's down there. So I highly recommend that you keep it, the max the screen as max as possible. So this, this uh, another thing people ask me say, well I, I can't get uh, my unit to uh, to talk to each other. Well, I quickly asked them, do they have it coupled into the 2000 network? And they look, look at me like they don't know what I'm talking about. But your units has to be networked in into a backbone system. This is a, a, what they call a NEMA 2000 uh, with Ethernet. And the Ethernet is part of your side and down imaging. But this diagram shows you that you, if you have multiple, if you, even if you have one unit, you need to have a, a, a NEMA network system, backbone system. So... If, once you put this system in place, if you add a unit, you literally all you have to do is take the Terminator off one end, put a key in, put your new unit to it, put the Terminator back on the T you just put on, and you're ready to go. So just quickly just show the NEMA 2000 network that pretty much for all uh, Gen 1, 2, and 3 uh, Lorentz units. Uh, transducer. Let's talk transducer. Skimmer is best for reading 2D. In the hole, that's for running down the lake to just give you a depth for running down the lake. Uh, and I, I tell people this, and do not use built-in transducers on trolling motors. And I know I get a lot of people argue with me that, that that they get real good signals. But when trolling motor companies put transducers, they put a generic transducer in that trolling motor. And in doing so, it, you think you're getting good quality, but if you ever see an uh, actual transducer that that's the right transducer to put on the trolling motor, then you'll understand that that is a generic transducer that they put in that trolling motor, and you can get a lot better reception uh, with the transducers that come with the units. Uh, another thing a lot of people don't know is you need to replace your transducers every three or four years. Uh, the crystals within the transducers wear out inside. so. A lot of people don't, don't know that. So, you know, guys that have them older boats and still got the same transducer on there and say, well, I can't, I, how come you can see fish on your son and I can't on mine? That's probably the reason why. So, uh, another good tip there about transducers. So, this, this picture right here kind of shows uh, a quick overview as far as how, what your boat uh, looks like with the 2D sonar, as you can see the cone. Uh, underneath the boat and then the down scan what it's actually seeing uh, in the view there so uh, 
Here's a, and then here's the same view, just looking at the end of it or the back of the boat. That's the same view. Uh, and people ask me all the time as far as the uh, side imaging, what where do you set your side imaging at? I, I typically whatever the water depth is. So if I'm in 20 foot of water, I typically set that at 40 to 60 foot off to each side. So that I'm looking I'm looking 40 to 60 foot off the left side, 40 to 60 foot off the right side. So you can, if you're in three to five foot of water, you can look 30 foot, 20 foot to the right or left, but the view is not going to be crystal clear like it would be if you were sitting in 10 foot of water and only looking at 20 foot. So that's just a good, good rule of thumb. Just always figure twice the water depth for your uh, side scheme. So this, this, these views here are basically what I have my unit set up for. Uh, each lake's different. Each uh, noise rejection is going to be different, surface clarity. But I highly recommend that you do not put any of your uh, sonar on automatic mode if you want a good, clear picture. And all these uh, presentations tonight are off of me fine-tuning it uh, per whatever lake I was on. So uh, this here is just a typical, this is this is a good rule of thumb of where I've got everything set on these presentations. So if you want to set yours there and kind of go from there as a, as a starting point, uh, it really works well. So and then you can see with the, the pictures that we're going to show in this presentation of how well it really does work. So anyway, that's the sonar set up. Uh, top left hand corner, uh, your keel offset. So if you're if you're looking if you're putting your transmitter or turtle motor and it's sticking two foot in the water, you're already two foot off on your depth. So you need to set for your keel offset. Uh, and then also another problem people have is the transducer. They say, well, I'm I'm fishing off the front of the boat, but I, all my images are coming off the back of the boat. Every there's a there's a little silver tag that's on the the the, the transducer cord where it plugs in the back of your unit. There's a little silver tag. On that silver tag, it's got a series of numbers and letters on it, and that tells you what that transducer is. So if you'll go into your sonar installation, look under transducer type, find the number and letters that match what's on that silver tag and put it to that and that's the transducer that that unit will read off of. So that's how you fix that problem. Uh, and like I said, that's a big problem that people have they ask me all the time, you know, I'm at the console, but it's reading off from the boat. Well, that's the problem. You, the, you have to go by what's on that silver tag and that's the transducer for that unit. Then that's one you want it to read off of. And if you have a NEMA network in, you can go in and hook and, and pull off of any transducer within that NEMA network. So, John, we still we still good? All good. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, let's talk about chart setup. Uh, like once again, uh, these are just some general rules of what I have on mine. Uh, it tells you as far as your uh, chart data. A lot of people say, "Well, I put the the my Lorentz my my they uh, got chip in, but it's still on Lorentz." Well, the chart data that has a drop down arrow there next to Lorentz, and if you put your avionics in, it it comes up either Lorentz or avionics. You have to change it to avionics. If not, it's going to automatically read Lorentz throughout a four Lorentz unit. So uh, another quick and easy way to fix a problem that a lot of people have. Uh, data overlay. Uh, all the overlay uh, information that you have on your graph, uh, all of mine is customized. I actually uh, edit all of mine to where it's as small as I need it to be so it doesn't obstruct the, the views of what I'm working on. Uh, and then I also go in and get rid of all of the the text uh, because if I'm if it says 70.9 feet I don't need to know that it says depth you can go in and take all that information off same way with water temperature this says 48 degrees I don't need it to say water temperature above so I take all of that text off of that screen 
just the word does not express my view. So that's another uh, uh, thing that a lot of people uh, don't know that you can do with these units. So, um, okay, let's get into measuring distance. So what you see on the screen here is you see a, a, a ledge that has uh, some stumps on it and you have some fish stacked around it. And I want to see what the where the, the top of that, that tree is in relationship to the bottom of the contour. So you can see that you quickly just hit your arrow over uh, down or down and to the left and it'll pull up and it'll measure the distance and you pop up your sonar screen and hit measure distance and it'll automatically measure your distance and give you the information in that in that reading right there. So your overall depth is 69.6 .6, and we know the top of that is 40 feet so we know exactly what that stands off and there again you can see what my sensitivity is setting at I, I know it says auto but I, I clicked it to auto uh, just so I could do all the color lines and get all that set into this view better so so this this right here is talking about uh, overlay uh, you can actually overlay your 2D and your 3D data over top of each other. So to do that, you go on the sonar and highlight the overlay, overlay down skin. And uh, I'll show you later on the presentation what that looks like. Okay, so let's get into uh, waypoint management part of the presentation. Uh, First thing you want to do before you do anything is go into your files and go into your waypoints and find find all your waypoints and back them up on an SD card. So once you go into the system into the files, waypoint routes, then you want to export them. And depending on what version, if you're dealing with a Gen 1, then you want to just save it as uh, a user data version 2. If you're dealing with Gen 2s or 3s, you want to use probably use them as a user data file version 4. What that does is, is the measuring of uh, distance down and up is also uh, calculated into the version 4. Uh, just a good rule of thumb, if you want to just start out by using the GPX, uh, that pretty much works on anything. It works on Rance, Garmin, uh, Hummingbird, it works on everything. So if you just want to start off by clicking on the GPX and saving it to your memory card, that's a good. And then after you do that, go down and save it as a username that you, uh, whatever you choose to use. Uh, the This one here just says Waypoints, Routes, and Trails 12. So did you, you set it up however you want to to save it so you don't, lose that information. You want to save that information on SD card. That's your starting point. So you can also export screenshots. So all the screenshots you've seen, you're going to see in the presentation today are these screenshots that's on the screen now and basically I saved them by numbers. So you can also save all your screenshots and I'll show you what those screenshots look like toward the end of the presentation. Uh, so once, once we go into it, uh, I find that that file, now that we have it saved on that SD card, I make sure that it's in that unit. And then what I want to do is I want to uh, import it in, into a SD card and put it on SD card where I can put it in my computer and utilize it to, to change my waypoint. So here's some screenshots uh, just talking about the like vertical fishing. Uh, just showing fish on drops on a, on drops and, and ledges. So, and this is thermocline. Uh, shows what a thermocline looks like with the. Uh, and you can see where I have my sensitivity, my color line, and I had to I had to fine tune it to get that thermal line to, sh to show in that view right there. So a lot of people say, "Can you see a thermal line on there?" Yes, you can. So this is the data overlay that we were talking about uh, a while ago, where you can overlay your 2D and your and your down scan over top of each other. Uh, 
the, the view at the top right is is that view uh, that's overlaid with 2D. And you can clearly see the difference between 2D and 3D. What it actually shows you is you actually have some rock there with uh, fish around them. And you can also see that you can see the balls of bait fish off to the left hand side. And this and the other view over here is the same down view, just turned sideways. Uh, here's a view of another uh, overlay. Shows the same shows the same thing uh, in 2D versus uh, the down scan. And here's a tree. What it looks like in uh, 2D versus the down scan. And this shows the end view of it. You can actually see the root wad at the bottom of the tree on that view. So let's talk bottom hardness. This is the, this is the difference in your pallets uh, showing the brighter returns uh, for your bottom hardness. The different color of pallets uh, can also tell you the difference in the hardness. Uh, as far as the purple white. The sapphire is also they're good palettes for seeing the bottoms. So if you're wanting to see what bottom hardness is, if you're looking for those uh, uh, shell beds, uh, you definitely want to switch it to those purples and whites where you can see the bottom hardness. It'll show uh, a lot brighter images. This is the exact same uh, uh, view with all the different palettes colors. Uh, a lot of people ask me what color palette I use. It depends on what I'm doing. If I'm if I'm side, side scanning, I usually use the browns and the blues. If I'm looking to see bait fish, I usually use the greens. Um, and then the, the, you know, the white background palettes work well for suspended targets. Uh, purples are useful for viewing structure detail and determining bottom hardness. Uh, so this just shows you the same, same view but different color palettes. There's the thermal plan uh, in the structure scan, showing you the, the really the same view as what we see while going 2D now. It's showing you in the down scan and the uh, side imaging. So this this view right here, I, I'm marking fish, and this view also tells me what size the fish are and what the mood the fish are in. Uh, People say, well, what do you mean by the mood? Well, I can see that there's some that's that's positioned around a rock in this view. I can see bait fish. I can see the ones that's next to the bait fish are pulled off the bottom and feeding on them bait fish. So with this side image and down image, I can clearly see what the mood of these fish are and where they're at in relationship to the bottom. And then you can also see the ones that are, are in relationship to the bait fish. So this is a real good picture that, that illustrates that. Um, say this, this is another view here. It shows that the, or the fish are on the left hand side. So I went, when I went over, if you look on the side scan view to the left right here, when I went over it, I actually went right over top of the center of that stump because you can see the stump is on both sides of my view right there. So when I did, all of the fish on the left hand side of, of my screen. So that tells me that all those fish that's on that stump are on the left hand side and they're out about 20 foot away from that stump. So that, that picture right there shows a real good view of, of fine tuning your side image and down image. Uh, this is a view uh, showing fish stacked up on a ledge or on a gradual drop right there. And uh, like I said, I can see that they're, 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 that's a good, if, you, if you're if looking for the ping pong, what I call the ping pong balls on your screen is what you're looking for. You see those fish that that are like that, that's usually good solid three, four pound fish in, the, in a school like that, that are stacked up. Uh, this review right here is solid three and four pound. If you, if you find that, you better drop a marker and start fishing. And I'll show you what these fish are. Uh, we actually fished a tournament, and we caught over 75 fish 
that day off of that off of these off these ledges, and that's what every one of them. Every one of them was exactly the same size. They all three and four pounders. So there's the picture of those. Those. Let me back up and I'll show you. There's that one fish that's on that screen right there. We still good, John? John? John, we still good? I think I muted myself. Yeah, we're all good. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure. I don't want I don't want to lose nobody. Okay, so so creating a waypoint. Uh on your on your unit it's got a little flag that's on your unit. You just quickly click on it and it'll pop up a screen. Uh, I tell people people say, Well, how do you save your waypoints? I save my waypoints my way out. Everyone else needs to save theirs however they I tell people this, if the, I want you to save a waypoint to where if you fish that same spot ten years from now, you know what to do and what time of year to do it at, if, if that makes sense. So uh, you need to set up your own system, your own way of doing your own waypoints, but you keep a constant uh, as far as the way you do waypoints. So if I use the same symbol for a ledge, I'm going to use the same symbol for ledge for any lake that I'm on. Or if you use it, the uh, same symbol for a state bed, you want to use the same symbol for that for no matter what lake you're on. So Creating a waypoint is pretty simple, but as far as do it, what you do with the waypoint is critical. So that's the part we're going to get into. So if you remember when we talked about the different versions of uh, that you could save it as, the version two is just going to show you a top view of the waypoint. The version four that we talked about for Gen two and three, as you can see in the screen, it tells you that. If, when you're saving that waypoint, you're saving it at 26.2 feet, and you're actually putting the waypoint down at 26.2 feet. So that's the difference between version two and version four as far as your your uh, saving your data. So before I fish a lake, I typically go to fishity, and there's a other there's a, a lot of uh, TVA and Fish and Wildlife Departments that have a lot of information, but Fish is a great tool. Uh, also encourage everybody uh, for additional, as far as new lake fishing, go to the blog and look at Jared's blog, the uh, article he just did on how he uses Fish on new lakes. It was a real well-written article, and it goes into greater detail. But uh, I use Fish all the time, and I'll show you how. So. Basically, we're looking at Barren River Lake, and I can clearly see that there is uh, 179 spots marked on this lake. I can utilize a lot of those spots depending on what time of year I'm fishing. So, so I find the spot, and if you'll go into the view map and the details, if you'll look, it gives you the latitude longitude of that particular waypoint that was on that lake. And it tells you that it was a deep diving crankbait. And not only that, it tells you what time of year it was. It was 7-5-2015. So if I'm going to be fishing that lake in the month of July, and if I can find this waypoint, and it's right there, it tells me what the longitude latitude is, I'm going to show you how you can take that information off the Internet and put it into a spreadsheet and put it into your unit. So this, this right here, what you're looking at, these are lakes that's on the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. And every one of those uh, lakes that's it's in blue there are on their website. And each year they put out brush piles and uh, state beds and all of these lakes. And they constantly update it. All this information is on this uh, on this website. And you, all you have to do is go in there and pull that information off, put it on your SD card, and download it in your unit. So when you take your SD card out of your thing with your Waypoint Trails 12 that we talked about, you're going to put it in, we're going to show you how to put it into an Excel format. And this is what it, the Excel format is going to look like 
once we convert it. So basically we're taking a Lorant unit, which is a USR, and I encourage everyone to, to write that down, and the USR is a Lorant, an HWR is a Hummingbird, and a GDB, GDP is a Garment. That is the file name that they're saved under when you convert them. So with Lorant, it's a USR, and this is an X. So I've taken all of the information that was on my Lorant unit, and I'm going to show you how to get it to this format where you can quick, if you do, if you know how to do simple Excel, you can take all this information and quickly sort it, clean it up, and reorganize it and put it right back into your unit and it's ready to go. So we're going to get into that here now. So also attached on this, uh, presentation is this that I created this uh, master decimal and symbol conversion chart. What this is, it gives you all the symbols that's on Lorance's, uh when you click a waypoint, it's got all these options as far as what symbols you use for each waypoint. What I have done is I have actually taken each one of those symbols and, com and converted them to figure out what the, the, the symbol name ac actually is and, I, and it's in this uh, Excel sheet. And what it does is it basically tells you what each one of those symbols and how to categorize them into your uh, Excel sheet. Uh, it also tells you what each one of the types of fish tractors are. So it tells you what, if I put it as a weighted brush pile, I already automatically know it's a local brush gathered and, and weighted with concrete blocks. So I have all of that information. So if I call it something on my screen, automatically know what that definition of that thing is. And like I said, yours may be totally different than what this is, but this is a good starting point. This, little, this, this spreadsheet has a lot of information on it. And it's part of the five, the part of the spreadsheets that will be uh, available uh, after the presentation. So this is GPS fertilizer. This is where all the uh, magic happens is what I call it. So if you go to GPS fertilizer, you can go on it's a free site. All this that I'm talking about tonight is completely free, guys. GPS Fertilizer, you want to go on to the GPS, the, where it says GPS Babel, and you want to pull that information up. So what you want to do is the top of it, it'll automatically come up as waypoints. You want to select your input file, which in this case, we want to take the file that we, call, that we called uh, uh, Waypoints Trails 12, put it there, and we want to output it as an Excel sheet. So you go down and you find that where it says common separated value and change it to an Excel sheet. And then when you get done manipulated in the common separated value sheet, when you go back, you just put it back as an input file, as a common separated at the top, and then the output, you save it as a Lorant USR format. And as you can see, I took all the information off of Fishity, put it into an Excel sheet. I, once I got done with it, I took that Excel sheet, I converted it to a fishity uh, waypoint USR, which now it makes it a Lorance file. So I take that file and I save it on my computer. I download it on an SD card. I plug it into my Lorance unit. I go in and find it in my files, download it, and there you go. It's it's in my unit. I didn't have to go in and put each one of them in one at a time or anything. All I do is copy and paste straight off of websites. Simple. Simple. All you have to do, uh, and people say, well, that sounds complicated. It's really not that complicated. Once you do one, one or two spreadsheets, it comes secondhand, and it's real quick and easy. You can, I, I can sit down and do over 100 waypoints in about 35, 40 minutes now, which is quite a few waypoints for only 35, 40 minutes worth of my time. Uh, so this part of here uh, talks about the video. You can actually, uh, on a Gen 3, you can actually take video. I think on a Gen 2, you can too. But you can take your old AquaView cameras. The uh, your old timers up there know what I'm talking about when I say AquaView cameras. They used to have the old black and white two-inch screen. You now can take that same AquaView camera uh, by the cord extension that you see in the bottom left-hand corner and put it in line with your power cord. And you can now uh, use your AquaView camera on your Lawrence unit, and that's what it looks like. So it's a pretty neat fit feature. I have it on mine. Uh, I use it quite often. I like showing it to a lot of the high school kids. Uh, they think it's really neat that you can drop a camera on the side of a bass boat and see fish. So 
it's a really neat fit feature that uh, the Gen 3s has come out with. So let's just talk about some of the stuff, uh, what we've covered here. So this, uh, these arrows are showing you exactly what, what you're seeing on the screen. So uh, hose shot plate will fix this. Uh, whitewash from the jack plate is what you're seeing there. That's what those lines you're seeing down the center of that. Uh, uh, hard bottom with fish, bright returns from fish means game fish, not bait. So uh, that's a good, a, a good, people always ask me, oh, I see glob down there, but I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. Use that rule of thumb right there, and that'll help. Uh, a lot of 90% of the time tell you what you're actually seeing as far as the fish uh, on the bottom there. Um, and then you can obviously see we're on Kentucky Lake and if you look guys it gives you the coordinates down the bottom. You can take the information I gave you earlier on the Excel sheet and you can plug that in and go right on Kentucky Lake and find that bed shell bed. So I'm I'm not keeping any secrets here. I'm showing you there's going to be some secrets. You're not going to see all of them at point, but this one here is off the tech lake. You, as you can see, it has a it has a stump on a shell bed on a ledge. It don't get much better than that. So, uh, so this right here is a sunken wooden barge. And once again, I left the coordinates on there. And I'll, I would like for somebody to tell me where that which lake that that's on. If, if someone can post that on Fishity. Uh, We'll see about giving away a prize. If someone can tell me where, what lake that is on, or maybe by the end of the presentation, tell me what lake that's on. Uh, we'll figure out something and we'll give, we'll, we'll give away the prize. But that's a sunken wooden barge, and then I'll show you another view of it. There's the same barge, just different contrast levels and different view of it. So, so this is the neat part. Everybody's been waiting for This is the part that uh, shows some neat and, and unusual things that uh, I've come across over the years. Uh, this is a bridge. Uh, it's an underwater bridge. And this shows you a side image of it. It shows you a down image of it. And it shows you a 2D image of it. So uh, it's pretty cool. So here's the same bridge. It just shows a different view of it. And it shows you with the side scan and a, and a down scan and 2D, what it looks like. Big difference between the 2D scan and the, and the down scan as far as showing you what that what that actually is. You can actually see the, the, the railing, the pickets on the rail on that bridge in the, in the down scan and in the side scan. That's a really good picture of that bridge. So this right here is some just some big rocks on a river ledge. Uh, you can see the washouts. Uh, from the current uh, around those rocks, you can see the words uh, uh, it's silted in between the rocks and stuff. So, and and you can also see uh, some fish that are stacked up uh, off the bottom in that in that top view there. So that's a, just some rocks on a ledge that's silted in around it. So these are uh, this was on a lake that did a lot of uh, excavating, and they had some. Uh, Apparently, the contractor had a bunch of earth moving tires left over, and he thought the easiest thing would be to just to pile them up and bomb the lake. So, uh, I know that, that I didn't screenshot it, but I, I had a picture of a tractor tire on the bottom of the lake, and it was on Kentucky Lake, and I could actually see the lugs on the tire, on the tractor tire. So, and, and then if you look down in your bottom right hand corner, it shows you a 2D image of what them tires look like on a regular sonar. So there have been no way I would have known that that was a tire with a 2D sonar. So here's some here's some more neat. These are ones that I pulled off the Lorant site. I didn't actually take these, but uh, there's an old school bus uh, laying on a ledge. And there's an airplane. I guess that's the plane that they were missing over there in Australia somewhere. I'm not sure, but there's a plane sitting on the bottom of bottom of the lake. Everybody always enjoys this part of the presentation. They think that's, that, that's so cool. And last but not least, here's an old train trestle bridge that's going across the lake. And if you look, you can see that the, the tree still standing on the far left hand side. And you see the uh, on each side of the train trestle, 
You can see the rock because you see how it's got a white uh, outline on it. To, that that solid rock that was on both sides of that train truss was and it's giving back a hard, a harder uh, bottom contour with that white. Uh, it really shows that that's got you know a real good hard bottom on it. Uh, and then the bottom there is just old fishing, sunken fishing ship. And there again, these are off the red side. I didn't personally uh, capture these. So that ends our class for tonight. Uh, I know that was a lot of information in a 45 minute uh, segment, but uh, if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to uh, shoot them over to Jared. Uh, while, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, I want to thank Jared for handling all the questions tonight. And I want to also thank John and Brian and Drew for allowing me to be a part of the Fishy family. Uh, and then also stay tuned after the questions. We're going to offer a 25% discount on uh, anyone that's joining us tonight for a premium subscription. Uh, and I'll give you the promo code at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to grab my phone real quick and see what questions that Jared is going to be sending to me.